this week we sat down and we had a pretty incredible conversation with an uh, influencer, a uh, business owner, a marketer, a content creator, um, Adrian Boisel. Uh, we've known him for a couple of months now. We've worked with him on the podcast and creating some content and some plans and um, just getting to see his work and understanding his process and then getting to hear the entire backstory. There is so much for people to take out of this conversation. I'm looking forward to everyone listening into this episode. Yeah. And I think that what's interesting about it is, you know, we do the podcast at the rising zone TRZ, which we did our first episode of this season with, and he, it, he just said he happened to be next door. So it's funny and cool to see things come full circle and, we are right next to somebody who does similar things, who has this consulting business and all of that. So to learn not just who he is, what he does, come together and brainstorm and work on, you know, different projects, I think has been uh, interesting. And to your point, like we didn't know the whole backstory. So to sit down and it's exactly why we do the podcast to hear more. Yeah. And the people that are listening to our podcast and the business owners and those that are looking for this type of service, he, he has a remarkable resume of what he's done in the past and then what he can create. And you can go on YouTube, you can go to his website, you can see it. Uh, and then to actually talk with him, he's very, very engaging. And then he shows you the way. So I'm looking forward to everybody being able to take a piece away that they can actually apply either to their business or maybe it's just their own personal life. But uh, there's going to be a lot of great content that comes out of this conversation. Yeah. And we're still learning and uh, growing and working together. So um, I'm excited for what we pull out of it as well as what the listeners do. Welcome to Tell Us Your Story, the podcast that tells the diverse stories of businesses, leaders, and influencers throughout Northern California. Our mission is to ignite inspiration, foster education, and bring our community together. Join us as we unravel the path to achievement, discovering how these remarkable businesses and leaders navigated obstacles, conquered hardships, and transformed failures into success. In this week's episode, we sat down with Adrian Boisel, business owner and consultant in digital marketing and content creator. There was a lot that happened in this discussion. We learned a whole lot about Adrian and three of the areas that we really want to focus in on would be overcoming adversity, building a business and success. And on the first one, when we talk about overcoming adversity, he has gone through so many different challenges in his life and he's come out on the top each and every time. Uh, just a, a little bit of a, a peek behind the curtains would be he ended up homeless at 17, 18 years old, uh, was able to pull himself up by his bootstraps, create a business, and he's thriving now. So overcoming adversity is definitely a, a theme throughout his his podcast. Building a business. Uh, as I said, he's a, he's a digital marketing, he's a content creator, he's a consultant, uh, he's a mentor. Um, and he's built this from scratch. Um, and when he walks you through the process of how he got to where he's at, um, the different relationships that he's had, the influencers that he's had, and just the the grind to get to where he, where he is today. And then success. Success can be measured a lot of different ways. I think family is the center of success for, for Adrian as well as his business, his community and his faith. Um, and he's gonna walk through all through all of those different pieces and what makes Adrian Boisel. So stay motivated, stay inspired, sit back and enjoy this episode of Tell Us Your Story. Uh, so I'm Adrian Boisel. I grew up in Sacramento, California, born and raised. I ended up living in Illinois for one year in my 20s. I was like, I got to get out of California or I'm never going to be able to escape this place. And I was raised by my grandparents for the first almost five years of my life until my grandfather passed away, uh, right in front of me actually, and then ended up Going to live with my dad from the time about almost five years old until you grew up with your grandma for the first five years. Any siblings? I'm oldest of seven, but none of them live with me. I'm the oldest. So oh wow, oldest yeah. of seven. Oldest of seven. And you were the only one with grandma. Grandma and grandpa. Yep. Okay. So where were parents? What happened? Walk us through it a little bit. So my dad met my mom when she was 14, almost 15, I think, and she got pregnant with me at 15 and had me at 16, and oh, wow. she was just a baby. And my dad was 19 at the time. He was already a legal adult mm. and he was in his party clubbing phase. And they quickly realized that they were not a fit because of a lot of different childhood traumas that my mom had gone through and a lot of different uh, personality disorders that my dad has that I don't think he's ever acknowledged or maybe even realized. So between, between the two of them, it was like 
you know, vinegar and whatever you want to say, however that analogy yeah. is. And so they just did not get along and it was a very toxic relationship. So they split um, right before they had my, my, they had my sister who's a year, it was like 13, 14 months um, younger than me. And so they had my sister and then they were done. They had split at the time and they were having major problems. And so my sister went to my grandparents. I went to my grandparents and they were taking care of me. My dad was really close with my, my grandma and my, and his dad. And so he would be over there all the time, but they were my, my caretakers for the first part of my life. Are, are these your, so these are your, you were oh, with my your dad's, dad's, dad's parents. Yep. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yep. So you get to five and then dad is matured a little bit and says time free or how <laughs> no. did you end up back with dad? So my gramps uh, was an alcoholic, did 28 years in the military, was a really good role model for me. He took We took bike rides almost every day on the American River and he'd read me stories to bed every night and just was a really huge father figure in my life. Like we were very, very close and he died uh, of a heart attack in right in front of me when I was four. And so from that point forward, uh, my grandma started to have to sell a lot, a lot of the belongings and video equipment. He had a business out of his garage, a video company. And she started having to sell his stuff. And one of the things came up was his car. And my dad was like, I want the car and I want this and I want that. And he's the only child. And so she was like, no, we're going to have to sell them. And he got mad and said, well, you're on your own. And she said, OK, fine. If I'm on my own, then you take your kid. Mm. Oh, wow. And so she handed me back to him. Oh. And he was in a long term relationship, I think, at that point after my mom and had, I think he had just gotten married to my stepmom now. And so I went to go live in Orangevale, Fair Oaks, Orangevale area uh, with both of them. And that was a, a whole nother experience because she and, didn't have any kids. And was your mom still around? No. Nope. OK, so let me these are curious questions now. So tell me if I'm way off base. Did you have abandonment issues like mm, yeah. mom, dad, have you leave you with grandma? Grandma has you for five years and then says over a car, you're going back to dad. Mm hmm. And I didn't know this. I didn't know any of those inner workings until I was older. You know, 10 or 12 years old is kind of when I found out how I ended up back with my with my dad. But you're moving around a lot. So you, you, you it, unstable. Is that Very unstable. Oh, yeah. I don't know anything else other than that, to be honest. And do you have a relationship with your, so your dad was around, but in mm -hmm. a way that was like. He was partying, working, getting his hustle on. Like he had his own priorities. My dad is all about my dad. Yeah. It wasn't like a. Only child. Actual it's all about me. Parental. I get what I want. No matter what. Mm. Got it. Okay. So let's take you into to junior high. You're uh -huh. with your your dad and stepmom. Yeah. Now I know you have a sister. So you said you have seven so, so or six siblings. Yep. So these are happening on both sides, I would imagine. Yeah. So from five until 10, I lived with my, my stepmom and my dad. And I had my brother and sister, Matthew and Megan. My brother, Matthew, is six years younger than me. My sister, Megan, is 10 years younger than me. So big age gap, and I was the big brother, you know. Stepsister, stepsister, step, half, 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 half siblings, half. right? Okay. Um, my dad and my stepmom had two, Matthew, okay. Matthew and Megan. And so I grew up with them. My brother and I were really, really close, and we got into all kinds of fun and trouble together, and and did everything together. He was like my little best friend, my sidekick. Like yeah. the moment he was born, I was, you know, making faces, and we were just extremely close. Like you could not separate us. We were inseparable. Um, and so at ten years old, I got sent off to go live with my grandma again. And I got sent off to Rancho Cordova, which you compare Rockland, Roseville. Actually, we were living in Granite Bay at the time. You compare Granite Bay to Rancho Cordova. Yeah. It's kind of a whole other world. What happened at 10? Yeah, why'd you have to go? Um, I was playing baseball at the time, and I hated it because the coach's son was the pitcher, and he was the worst pitcher you'd ever seen. It was like he was basically blind at that point. <laughs> and he would throw the balls, and it would hit me. And it kept hitting me. It kept hitting Every time you go up to bat, he would throw a ball basically at you. And I just got sick and tired of it, and I was frustrated and just at my wits end with the team. I was like, I don't want to play baseball anymore. I'm done with it. And then that's when my dad's abuse, that's what he did my whole childhood growing up, very physically abusive and verbally abusive, started being very abusive, and I just he always made me feel really small. And so mm -hmm. I decided, I don't want to even live here anymore, and I told my brother that. And so my brother ended up going to the store with him and said, Adrian doesn't even want to live here anymore. So my dad comes back from the store and said, pack your stuff. We're going. Wow. And oh took my stuff and dropped me off in, in, uh, in Rancho Cordova with my grandma. And a little bit before that, I had actually had my grandma had reported my dad, I think, two times to CPS for all the abuse mm -hmm. that I had physical experienced. Abuse. Physical abuse, yeah. Oh. Wow. Uh, and so then take us through going into junior high mm -hmm. time. So are you still with grandma? How long did you stay with grandma after that? From um, I was with her for two years. Two years. Yep. 
and so, then go back to my dad. gosh, it's not a long time. No, it's a lot. So I was happy to go with my grandma because she was like my mom. So I didn't have my mom my whole yeah. life, didn't meet her till I was 17. So I was like, Yay, grandma, I get to finally be with somebody who loves me and treats me and takes care of me, gives me food, and you know, just is there for me and, and isn't going to abuse me. And so I, w- I loved that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was having a lot of behavioral challenges and problems. A lot of kids, I was the smallest kid in the whole school. It, all throughout my whole entire life, redheaded, freckle face. I mean, it was, mm. it was like all the, all the cliches, right? Redheaded stepchild. And so I was getting picked on a lot. And because I had grown up in a house that was very abusive, there wasn't one kid in that school that scared me. And so as soon as somebody would pop off at the mouth, I was going to handle business really fast mm. and I wasn't going to hesitate. I was fearless. I just had no, I was, I was fighting a grown adult, you know? Yeah. And so I was, there's just no hesitation or worries about getting in a fight with somebody. So as soon as someone would pick on me, it was like, cool, let's go. And I had one kid specifically that came behind me for like two weeks after I first got to the school and he would push me, he would push me. And finally I went to my grandma. I was like, I want to handle this situation. She's like, don't, don't ever back down to a bully. You need to, you need to stand up for yourself and tell him what's up. And so the next day at school, he comes up to me and I knew it. I saw it coming. As soon as he came around, I just spun around and just smacked him and he went right into a bush and bam, I got suspended from school. Mm. And as soon as you do that with one kid, now there's a line of kids like, oh, yeah. I could take him. I could take him. I could take him. And so that started a whole string of fights. And after about my third or fourth fight, uh, over the course of a couple of years, my grandma was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. He's having behavioral problems. He's not doing good in school. My dad was like, well, give him back to me. I want him. Mm-hmm. He wanted his worker back, his little worker bee, which I had been, even in my younger years, he was doing concrete work and you know construction work. So he wanted me back so that he could benefit off of all of my work. And so I ended up going back and living with him and moving to Rockland. And then I started going to, I went to one year of junior high in Rockland, uh, my eighth grade. And then uh, about three or four months, maybe five months um, of my uh, freshman year of high school. At Rockland, so, go ahead. Yep. So did you, did you, okay, so chaotic, right? Yeah. Probably angry all the time. Yep. Everything in hindsight, you could look back and be like, oh man, all the things you go through as a kid. But did you know, like in the moment, like, this isn't normal. Like other kids don't have to deal with this. Like, did you feel angry and stuff all the time? You just, no, I didn't feel angry all the time. That's what's interesting is when I was angry, I was angry, but when I wasn't angry, I was the like, people would come up to me like, dude, how are you always smiling every, all the time? Like some of the teachers and principals Mm -hmm. and people that knew my situation and had heard about CPS and things like that. They're like, how are you, how is it that you're always smiling and so happy all the time? I'm like, I mean, I'm not getting my butt kicked, you know, (laughs) I'm, I'm not with my dad and, I got, I mean, life's pretty good for me, you know, and Mm -hmm. nothing bad is happening right now. So I'm just happy. It's just who I am as a person. That's just my, my baseline is just to be grateful and happy. And so I was happy with very little. My, my, my tolerance for BS Mm -hmm. was so high that I didn't have a whole lot of expectations for myself or for my life. And so what were your, what were your going into high school? What were your dreams? If any, like, what was the thought of, did you play sports? Were you doing anything? Were you just in (laughs) trouble? Did you get into drugs? Like, no. what was the pot? Yeah, it's interesting. You'd think I would, like, the statistics say that I would have gotten into drugs and yeah. alcohol and partying. Not once did I ever Just touch any interested? of that stuff. Zero interest. And why were you not interested? Like, the alcohol was specifically because of my grandfather and watching him die in front of me. That left an imprint yeah. of, okay, he died of alcohol, so we're not going to go down that road. Um, the drugs was because I didn't have my mom in my life because I was told my whole life that it was because of drugs. So my mom was on drugs and because of that, she wasn't in my life and she wanted nothing to do with me is what I was told. And so I figured drugs were bad and drugs were evil. And I grew up in the nineties where don't do drugs and just say no and all yeah. that stuff. So I was like, cool, I'm going to avoid that like the plague. And so what, what did leave an impression on me was my grandfather's entrepreneurial career and his military career. And he was my hero still is to this day, mm-hmm. even though he made a lot of mistakes in his, in his younger years and was an alcoholic. He was a very kind, loving, sweet, devoted uh, and loyal man, and he was entrepreneurial, and so he was so good to me that that those memories stuck with me throughout my whole life. And I wanted to first be in the military; that was my goal, is to follow in his footsteps, but not the Air Force, because I was like, those guys are a bunch of nerds. I'm, I'm going to be, in, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to get on a plane, on a ship that's going the ba- the opposite direction, that's a quarter the size of a regular landing strip, and I'm oh. going to land that thing. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. My grandfather Top would be so proud. Marketing. Every, Top gun. All the marketing. I grew up in the there. 90s, right? <laughs> Top Gun was it. I'm like, that's Commando, what I'm going to do. everything else was that. And then I was like, and then when I get done with that, I'll, I'll become a police officer and probably like some sort of detective, like NCIS kind of thing. And, and then when I get out, I'm going to 
I want to be like an undercover detective. And then maybe like when I'm done with that career, then I'll go and be like a private detective and do that kind of work. Cause I was, just, I can fit in with anybody, you know, at that age, I'd already realized yeah. like I can fit in with any group of kids. Cause I went to 12 different schools growing up, whether it was the black kids, the Mexican kids, the ghetto kids, the, the pot smoking kids, the, the nerdy kids, the theater kids, like didn't matter who it was. I could fit in with any of them. So I was like, I'm a chameleon. I could just be with any group. So I want to be like an undercover narc officer and get drugs off the street. Right. <laughs> so you active you imagine. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Active imagination. You're sitting in there daydreaming every day. Oh, yeah. Um, I can relate. And so was your when – you, when you were living with your dad and your stepmom, was it – did you have strict rules or did you oh, have freedom? Yeah. Oh, no, zero freedom. Zero freedom. I, was, I was out of my – see, you think five to ten years old just in that period alone, those five years. During those five years, I was probably grounded 80 percent, 90 percent of the time to my room, was not allowed out of my room, was not allowed to go do anything. And then the times where I wasn't, it was like, get out. Don't come back. And if you do come back, you're going to be, you're going to be grounded to your room the rest of the day. So I was either not allowed outside or I was not allowed in home. So I wasn't, I wasn't accepted or allowed anywhere. Yeah. And it was a different time because we didn't have cell phones at those mm -hmm. times and things that you could just get lost in. It was different. Like exactly. TVs with knobs on them. Um, <laughs> so what was your passion in high school? What were you like, what were you doing? So I found video production in high school and ended up doing the daily announcements for my whole school at Wood Creek. And I was there like, hey, you're the skateboarding is not a crime guy. Skateboarding, dirt bikes, BMX, like that was my my hobbies, go pads, whatever had wheels and a motor or wheels and I could go fast. That was my whole, that was it. Those were the sports that I was into. I did wrestling in uh, freshman year of high school for a little bit and then sophomore and junior year. But where my real passion was, was extreme sports, like anything that was involved doing something crazy or risky. Yeah, and then, exactly. <laughs> so... I just talk on a podcast. I'm not a psychologist, but been through some things. So mom's not there. Trouble with dad. Gr grandpa passed away in and out. So are these extreme sports your way of like gaining acceptance and excelling? Yeah. And excelling. people like looking at you and accepting you and bringing you in like mm -hmm. and the love and the, the f almost family. Yes. From that area. Oh, then, my. I used to say all the time, like I don't have like my friends are my family. My family that I have other than my grandma, those those people are my relatives. And then, so did you have aspirations of going on in school or were yeah. you going to go be a motorbike? Like, so, X, I mean, at one X point games. I wanted to be a WWE wrestler, like the Hardy Boys <laughs> and do backflips off the ring. That was all through like my middle school years. And then I was like, well, then I'll be a pro dirt biker. And then I was like, and then at about 15 years old was when the military bug really got planted in me. I don't remember how or where, but there was somebody in my life um, that kind of left an impression on me. And I was like, military is where I'm going. So from that point forward, it was like everything was just dedicated to so like, I'm going to get into the military. Everything I'm doing is all towards the military. So I want to finish high school and then go into the military mm. and and go, f you know, live out my career in that. And then as soon as I'm done, because I knew I wasn't going to be a, like a lifelong military like my grandpa, I figured I'd do eight years, get out, become a cop, become a private detective, and then start my business, something around that. And then in high school, I found video production and I was like, I got to somehow do video communications. I won a couple of awards in high school for doing video production. I'm like, okay, maybe I need to somehow work this into what I'm doing. Maybe get a communications degree while I'm in the military and do some sort of communications because I think I like this. Maybe as like a backup plan. Did that stem from, you said your grandpa did the video. Was that, yep. do you think... Like subconsciously, or did you do that with him? Like you I did that with him as a little kid. Yeah. Like he'd have me in his in his office, and I'd be sitting down on the floor, and he had this little video tool that he had me playing with, mm -hmm. and he had this little drawing tool, and I, I was drawing my whole life growing up as a kid, so I was always an artist. And then my stepmom, actually, one of the few things that she said to me that was positive that left a really good impression was, I don't know what you're going to do someday for a living, but I know it's going to involve art and computers. Wow. And so with with video, I was like, I can take my graphic design and my mm -hmm. artistic skills along with my passion for video and combine those into one. And I see something here that I can do. And so the, when you start having like getting awards from everybody in, this, in the whole region, like I won an award and got to go to the Sacramento, they call it SPRA, Sacramento Public Relations Awards mm -hmm. at the Doubletree at like 16 years old. And I'm winning this award and being it presented like in front of all these news anchors from Univision and Fox oh, 40 wow. and like all that. I was like, oh, there's something here, yeah. right? So that kind of opened my world up to like, yeah. I really love video. And so I started, you know, filming my skateboarding videos and BMX videos and all that stuff. Very cool. And so then take us through graduating high school. Uh, did you graduate high school? So the long and short of that, without going down a whole other rabbit hole, is I found my mom um, oh. in my 
end of my junior year, beginning of my senior over that course of that summer. So you went looking for your mom, an important part. I, of I the didn't summer. actually. Oh, you I didn't. went looking for my sister. Oh, okay. And I was no interest in my mom because of everything I'd ever been lied to and told by my dad and my grandmother. Uh, I don't know if my grandmother was lying to me. I think she was just telling me what my dad had told her, but I was lied to about the situation with my mom. And so I was looking for my sister and I had heard she was in Galt with my grandparents. And so I started calling around and this was the time when AOL chat and Yahoo chat was getting really big. And I found a chat room and one of the kids in the chat room went to Galt high school. Hmm. And I was like, Hey, do you know my sister? And he's like, yep, here's her phone number. And I was oh, like, wow. and I found her. And so I was like super excited. I'm like, Oh, and I think I told somebody in my house, it was my brother or somebody. And that got back to my dad, hmm. which resulted in a physical altercation. Hmm. And so he, uh, he was like, basically pack your stuff and get out or I'll pack it for you. So I was walking down the road. I called my grandmother on my mom's side and said, Hey, you know, and I talked to my mom for the first time and was like, Hey, I'm kind of got nowhere to go homeless again. Cause it's the second time I've been homeless. I'm like, I'm homeless again. I need some help. And so they came and picked me up and took me to Galt. And that's the first time you had seen your mom and how long? I didn't actually see my mom yet until a few months later. But grandparents, um, So right? my grandparents. That's the first time I met my grandparents, first time I met my sister. And so I just didn't know what was, was going to happen. I was very naive, you know, young and naive, a little experience and a lot of abuse. And so I was just like, I just wanted to be connected to that part of my family who I didn't know. Turns out that they were very abusive, very toxic, even worse than my dad. Like from a, from a more emotional, just kind of abusive, even sexually abusive kind of arena. Mm. Um, and so they were raising my sister her whole life. And so I came to, to be in contact with them. My mom was super worried about me being there. I didn't know this until later on, uh, but I ended up only living there for about six months until they kicked me out because of my sister and a bunch of lies that she had made up against me. And so I ended up getting dropped off in Sacramento at 17 years old by myself at my best friend's house who had just bought his own apartment. And I just showed up at his door, and that was the first time in my life where I was like, all right, I'm ready to end it. I don't have my dad. He's cut me off from my grandma. I can't talk to my brothers or my sisters because they've cut me off. My mom and I had had a falling out, like, I think that day or the day before. And she was like, I'm like, How, why, why would you treat me this way? Like, you haven't been with me my whole life, and now you're going to treat me like this? And she's like, you know why? Because I'm the effing mom, and then just hangs mm -hmm. up on me. So now I had nobody. All I had left was my best friend, Devin. And so when you say you're ready to end it, you're talking about suicide. Mm -hmm. And so I have to ask a question here. So um, because I know you now and faith is a big part of your life. Oh, yeah. So at this stage of your life, is are, are you and God have a relationship or does it happen later in life? So I, I was in youth groups and stuff as, as a young kid, and I knew of God. I knew about God. My stepmom had given me one other piece of advice uh, and an analogy of, of faith that had kind of planted a seed in me, but it hadn't sprouted any kind of fruit yet. And so I knew God, and I called myself a Christian. Uh, but up until that, about that season of my life, I had pretty much said, the hell with all this. Yeah, that's what I was asking. And I was I agnostic is essentially what happened. People would ask me, "What are you a Christian? I'm like, no, I'm agnostic. I don't really know what I believe anymore. I've pretty much given up hope. Yeah, I was asking because at that point, you're not leaning on your faith. That wasn't no. something you could turn to. So, no. okay, take us back to your best friend. You're 17. Are so you out I, of school? Yeah, so they dropped me off. I was going to Galt High School, and my grandparents just picked me up and dropped me off. Uh, and so there was no – I was an hour away from my school, so there was no going to school. Like, I couldn't enroll myself in a school. I was just basically forced to drop out of school. Wasn't even given the option. And so they just said, where do you want us to drop you off? And I'm like, well, I have nowhere to go. And they're like, well, you got to pick somewhere. And I'm like, I mean, I guess I'll go to my friend Devin's house. He just got mm -hmm. an apartment. So I'll go over there, not expecting or knowing even if that was going to be realistic or possible. I was expecting to sleep on the streets if I'll, you know, back again. So um, knocked on his door for an hour. He didn't answer. Took an hour to, for him to answer. Finally, he answered. And I just kind of collapsed into his door. And he, like, you know, grabbed me and kind of just held me as I was just sobbing. I mean, I was at the lowest mm -hmm. point of my whole life up to that point. And uh, just sick and underweight and just just not in a great place. And I was just like, what's the point of this anymore? And he talked to me and kind of helped me come out of it a little bit. And uh, I went to sleep that night. And it's funny how anger works. I was woken up at about, I don't know, probably 3 o'clock in the morning by my friend Devin's roommate, Dan, who didn't know me from Adam. And he had taken a bottle of... Uh, mustard. And while I was sleeping, 
squeezed it into my mouth. Oh my gosh. And I, <laughs> being, being the background, the background that I have, <laughs> I picked him up and pretty much threw him across the room. Mm. I said, don't you ever touch me. Don't you ever mess with me again. And I had a, a really harsh sensitivity towards sleeping because sleeping on park benches and being outside and hanging out with train riders and gang members and things like that at 16 kind of created a little bit of a PTSD yeah. for me. Yeah. So I was always on edge. And so when I'm woken up from a sleep, that means danger. And so I just kind of reacted and he's like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I was just playing around. I was just playing around. And, and I'm like, dude, you don't know me, dude. Like you don't want to go there with me and just let I me mean, slam him against the wall. And so it was the next, that next morning, my friend Devin's girlfriend was like, he can't stay here. He can't stay here. If he's going to be causing problems. I'm like, I'm not the one that caused any freaking problems here. <laughs> yeah. Like he's the one that caused the problem. And so they ended up telling me I couldn't stay there. So I had like three or four days to basically get out of there. And my friend Devin's uncle is the one that took me in and I met him. And by the grace mm. of God, he was like my first real, real solid mentor that I had helped me write a letter to my mom, which restored that relationship, tons of stuff. So, wow. and so what about school? Did you, did you finish? So how did you go back? I was, you go back? I was so angry from being woken up that morning. I was like, Oh, <laughs> I just, now the self pity and all that stuff was gone. And I, that fire had re, kind of reignited back into me. And I was just like, enough is enough. So I walked over to the AMPM gas station at five o'clock in the morning, bought a Sacramento B and started calling every single number in the, in the job hiring section. And so just, just calling. And I finally got an answer by a guy who, uh, who was the manager for a cell phone stand inside of the, uh, the sunrise mall. And he's like, yeah, I'll interview you. So I, I think I borrowed a shirt from somebody, a nicer shirt, and I showed up at the Sunrise Mall, and he's like, how old are you? And I'm like, 17. He's like, oh, man, I'm so sorry, man. I can't hire you. You're not 18. You have to be able to sign contracts. I was like, well, is that really that big of a deal? Like, is anybody going to know? And he's like, man, I really like you. I see something in you. I don't know what it is, but I see something. And now I'm talking to the owner. So the manager passed me over to the owner, and I'm sitting there at the a w There's an old a w yeah. next <laughs> to the kiosk in the Sunrise Mall. And he's like, I just want to take a chance on you. If anybody asks, tell them you're 18. I was like, cool. He hired me right there on the spot. And I became his number one sales guy in 90 days and sold more cell phones than anybody in the entire region and won uh, tickets to the River Cats game and had a box suite. And I brought my best friend Devin with me. We sat there and ate steak sandwiches. Yeah. That was like my first so big win. You that know? was a big win. So things changed. So your dreams, like the military not graduating Shot. right off off the table. Oh, the whole plan. The whole plan, gone. Um, and you're just maybe the excitement of your first job kind of took that away. Are you, it seems like you pivot easily. Like, okay, oh, yeah. well, we're going to go this way. And yeah, I don't it hesitate. is what it is. Yeah. yeah. It, that's that resilient part of me. I was like, okay, cool. Well, I guess we're going this direction. And the military dream was shattered a little bit earlier. Cause I went to maps to do all my processing and they're like, cool. Your ship out dates July 17th on your stepmom's birthday. I'm like, wow, that's the best gift ever. <laughs> Sweet. Right. And then I find out a week later that I failed my hearing test and they have to have me retest. Oh. And so I'm deaf legally in my left ear. And so they're like, sorry, we can't let you in. I'm like, well, what about the army? And what about the Marines? I'll go be a bullet sponge. And like no. all these different things I try to get around. What about a waiver? And just nothing I did was going to get me through. And so I had to, to let go of that. But um, getting that first cell phone job was like my first win. And I had some mentors at that time that had come to the booth and I had sold cell phones too. And they were like, giving me advice on sales and man, you can make more than doctors doing sales and you should do sales and sales and sales. And I'm like, okay, my dad did sales and he did pretty good. And I got a personality and I love people. So I think I could do sales. Like I have a knack for people. So sure. And then I remembered in the back of my mind that when I was working at Pluto's in the gallery mall that used to be there, I had met a guy that used to work with my dad in the car business. His name was Chris Kircher and he was the finance director for John L. Sullivan Chevy. And I would make him a salad all the time. He'd come in. I'd start his conversation. I just built relationship equity with him. So about two weeks before I turned 18, I called him. And I was like, hey, I'm selling cell phones. I'm doing really good. I just won this award. And I want to come sell cars. Can you help me? And he's like, yeah, man, absolutely. When do you turn 18? I'm like, June 12th. He's like, come in on your birthday. Came in there on my birthday. Got hired on the spot. Mm. And boom, I was in the car business. Yeah. One of the hardest oh, sales wow. jobs in the world. And um, <laughs> one of the greatest teachers. Oh, yeah. So did you ever go back to high school? Nope. Nope. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought we were going. Um, and now you go into the car business. Did you ever, do you ever regret not going and finishing? To school? a degree. Yeah. I mean, to a degree, I, it's definitely something that was unfinished, but it's kind of been a pattern and a, and a weak point in my whole life is just starting things and not finishing them. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, and I thought, Oh, I'll go get my GED. Oh, I'll go, I'll go get the high school equivalency test. But I was so busy in survival mode. Mm -hmm. that I, I couldn't make the time. It's not that I couldn't find the time. I couldn't make the time to go back and make that a priority. Cause I'm like, I'm doing fine without it. 
you know, I'm making six, seven thousand, eight thousand, ten thousand dollars a month in the car business. Like, what do I need that for? Yeah. And so, how old are you now? I'm 18 years old. No, no, no. Today. Oh, 36. 36. Mm-hmm. So, I have to do the math. 18 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, Crazy. And so, does that? <laughs> Like we've talked to people, whether it be high school, college, like I didn't finish college. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad made me go. I dropped out of high school. He made me go back. I had to finish it. Uh, mm-hmm. Does it sit with you? There are there times where you sit in a room and you feel like you have imposter syndrome no. or are you way past I'm that? I'm so yeah. far past that. So how did you get past that? Because some people sit with that and be That's like, a great question. Um, I can't, some people just sit with it and they can't get past it. Mm-hmm. I, I think I came, came to realize pretty quickly that the education system is what failed me. I didn't fail the education system. Um, that they just passed me along and I was on track to graduate early despite having bad grades my whole, my whole life and just being pushed along and pushed along and pushed along and lacking a lot of foundational things, especially in math. Like I remember just reaching that point in like my sophomore year of high school, just like sobbing and crying, just being so upset. And my teacher, Mr. Grady being like, Hey, you're just missing some foundational pieces. And he took the time only teacher I had in my whole high school year that took the time to sit down and like mm-hmm. reteach me those foundational things. And like, once it like, I learned that it was like this huge breakthrough and I was like literally tears of joy. Like, Oh my gosh, this is so simple. Like I was just missing this key critical piece and now it all makes sense. And so uh, just barely getting through high school, but still doing well enough to basically graduate early and then just getting pulled out. And I never got to finish that. I think after I started reading books and realizing like being an autodidact is what I can would consider myself or just being an avid lifelong learner, just continuously book after book. I've, I've read over well over 300 books at this point. And so after reading Think and Grow Rich and Secrets of the Millionaire Mind and all the different books that I've read, even in those younger years, I read some some books that were really impactful. Um, I realized that there wasn't anything that some teacher, professor, educator couldn't teach me that I couldn't teach myself. So when you're selling cars, you're making six, eight thousand dollars a month, Mm -hmm. 18, 19, 20 in that age range. Mm -hmm. So are there times where you're, you're doing it with a chip on your shoulder because you don't have it? Because now you can look back and you've learned all that. But when you're 19 or 20 and people are coming in with whatever diploma they have, like yep. I, I, I've been in the environment. Yep. Sometimes you see people work twice as hard because they're like, I don't belong here. I don't belong in this pedigree. Yeah. Was that ever part of you or you're just like, no, no because mm-hmm. as a kid from the time I was about six or seven years old, I was hustling. I was doing business deals. I was building my own little side businesses, selling stuff to the kids in school, drawing on their cards, drawing on envelopes. I mean, art was my way that I made money. And so that carried me all through, just like my grandfather that carried me all throughout high school. And then into my young, I was, even while I was in the car business and selling cell phones, I still had side hustles. I'd set up a booth at Denio's and sell vases and glass. And I, I was always, I always had some sort of business going on on the side. So I knew that I was getting sales experience that was going to help me in my entrepreneurial journey. I was just waiting for the right time for my entrepreneurial journey. So I love it. And when you think back, you, you obviously hadn't read 300 books then. You didn't no. know a sales process. I was like four or five you, were just a, you were a hustler. Uh-huh. So um, you were you had your hands in a lot of different things. So when you were selling those cars, I would imagine you didn't go read the manual on how to be a great car salesman. So why were you so good? What What differentiated you from the other people? I have some theories on it, but I want so to hear from you. Because I love people so much. Uh, and I'm just so genuine in my approach to just learn and ask questions and be inquisitive and be curious. Uh, there was a few people at the dealership that kind of took me under their wing. And even though I had some problems with some of the guys there that were older guys that wanted to start stuff with me and I still hadn't worked out any of my stuff and got into a few altercations, not like physical, but like verbal altercations with a few people there. Like, Hey, you got to knock that off. And you know, cause some issues there. They still were very good to me. A couple of the guys and, um, one of them's name was Bart and he was just, he just saw something in me. And so he kind of mentored me and it's like, gave me some hope. I was like, I see something in you. You have so much potential. Like you could be a, a big shot here in this dealership. If you just stick, put your head down and stick to this. And, and so I knew my future wasn't going to be in the car business, but they brought in some sales trainers. I think one of them's name was like Art Davies. He's really well known in the car industry and a guy named, um, Walt Dabrowski. He's still around today. In fact, I had him here at my office here a couple of years ago. Um, longtime mentor, sales trainer. I got to train with him back in the day. So he gave me some fundamental sales training. And I just kept thinking, like, like, this guy is all he's ever done in his whole career is selling cars and sales and sales training. Like he's making half a million dollars a year. I can do that. If he can do it, I can do it. Right. There's not and whatever challenge came my way. I ever see somebody doing something I want to do. I'm like, I'll learn how to do that. 
Like it's I had no hesitation. Fire. It lit a fire. I'm like, not okay. everybody has that. It yeah. might be the opposite. Sometimes it's the opposite, especially coming from such a kid. Yeah. Like, it's interesting in your story. You've like named multiple people that have, I think been really impactful at the time, you mm-hmm. know, your friend's uncle, this guy at the car dealership, right? Your grandpa, the teacher. That's right. Um, so were you, are those kind of hindsight realizations of like, wow, that was impactful or in the moment you think like, Oh man, this guy's going to get me to the next level. This person's going to get me to the next level. And this is super impactful. I think I've always valued my mentors. I, I've always looked to, cause my grandmother was in the bowling league when I was a kid. And so there'd be these old timers that were in their sixties and seventies when I was like 10 years old, you know, they're long gone by now, but they were like yeah. in Vietnam and in the Korean war and they had Korean wives and they had so much wisdom. So I just like follow them around the bowling alley and ask them questions. And they teach me how to like super glue my wounds shut. And like, yeah. I just was like obsessed <laughs> with just learning as much as I could from them. Yeah. So I kind of had this old soul personality from a very young age. I think people saw that even in my young, young and late teen years. And when I was first working in these different jobs, they could see that I was hungry and I was just honestly operating out of that survival mentality. Mm-hmm. I want to jump to the last five, six years okay. and talk about your growth, the challenges that you've had, and yeah. um, let you share what you want to share, and we'll just jump in. So we go back over the last four to five years. When did your business start, yeah. and then how did the last couple of years come together? So my business started out of um, the recession, basically, and the recession for me started in 06. So I was in the car business in 05. Bumped into an old friend of mine slash mentor who I used to play basketball with. who's about seven or eight years older than me. And he's like, I'm in the mortgage industry. I'm making $40,000 a month. I'm like, what'd you say? <laughs> he's like, $40,000 a month. Look at my check I just got. And he hands me this check. And it literally said $41,000. <laughs> like out of Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, and I'm seriously. like, yeah, exactly. Like a joint. I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like, this poor kid. And I'm like, all right, what do I need to do? And he's like, you can do exactly what I'm doing. I'm like, tell me how. And he's like, you just got to call 200 people a day. I was like, I can call 200 people a day. He's like, sweet. I'll give you a script. I'm like, sweet. Put me on the phones, and I'm just dialing for dollars. Just call mm-hmm. after call after call. And so that was 2006. And in 2006, all the banks started shutting down. ABC mm-hmm. Lending, all these big companies. And so now the lending has changed, and we had put people in all these option arm, pick and pay, horrible loans that I didn't know anything about. I was just selling it. And the industry just tanked. And so I went six months with no income. Mm-hmm. Ended up losing my car. Got into some trouble because of it because I took my dad's advice. I was living with my dad at the time for like a month, almost a month, like three weeks until he locked me out because I didn't give him money. And he sold all my stuff that I had made while I was in the car business on Craigslist. We had a huge falling out and a physical altercation where he punched me and all this crazy stuff happened. Right. And I'm like, oh, and so I had nothing. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to go move to Vegas. So I went to move to Vegas. I get a call from one of my mentors who was the high school cop at Wood Creek. And he's like, I need you to come back. We got a warrant out for your arrest because of this car incident that you had. And I know that you probably didn't do this, but like, I I just got to get you back here. Otherwise you're going to get thrown into jail in Vegas and you don't want that to happen. I'm like, okay. So I come back, get on a Greyhound 14 hour trip. It was miserable and worked it all out, but ended up having to do a 90 day sentence in jail Mm. and spent 31 days actually in jail. So they gave me a 90 day sentence. I did 31 days in jail. And that's where I was like, well, I got nothing to lose. I'm at the very bottom. And my mentor, Larry, at the time, who I had been doing graphic design and nightclub promotions on the side of, of mortgage industry and the car business stuff, I've been doing that for a couple of years now, was like, I was like, dude, this is the end of my life. I made this mistake. I shouldn't have listened to my dad. It's all my fault. And he's like, this is not the end. This is a turning point for you. Don't ever listen to your dad again. Don't ever listen to his advice. So I filed a fake claim, car insurance claim on my car because my dad was a car insurance agent. That's literally what he did for a living. So let me pause and ask you a question because I know you now, who I've met now. And, yeah. Um, your father, your husband, man of faith, you have your business. If I would have known you then, yeah. w- were you shady? Like, could we just no. go do things or you just no. made some bad decisions? I just made some bad decisions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because when you hear it, and you think, was, when, you th- when you hear the story and you start walking through it, like you're in and out, you're, you're chasing the money, you're in yep. the car sales. Not that that's, you know, shady, but For then sure. you're ending up in jail. So I just want, I'm trying to. I was to, just trying to survive. Yeah, trying to get the image. Okay. I was trying to survive and I knew I wanted to do better than my parents my dad and my, and my, my mom. And I just knew I needed a better life than them. And I was destined to create a better life than them. So it wasn't about anything other than trying to survive. It was just survival. And you didn't have mentors. Like you had mentors that you're talking about throughout, but you didn't have a father figure. No, I had no father figure. Uh uh, Passed away. Okay. So sorry. So, so yeah, getting back to, um, you were in jail, you did that, you got out. I decided to write my business plan in there. He's like, to use this time oh, wow. to get your life in order, to get your head on straight, and to get get your stuff figured out. 
do, and he's like, you have a talent for this graphic design stuff and for this printing stuff. You need to go all in on this. I'm telling you, go all in on this. And I was like, okay. So I wrote on yellow line paper, I wrote the entire business plan, how many people I was going to call every day, just like in the mortgage industry. I'm going to call a hundred people a day. I'm going to close five deals, a hundred dollars a deal. I'm going to make $500 a day, put it all down on paper. It was very clear to me. And I sat there for 31 days and like meditated and prayed on it. And my face started to kind of come back a little bit. Starting to recover a little bit in, in jail. in jail. It happens in jail. <laughs> and I started working out every day. I got in one of the best shapes I've ever been in my whole life, like back one of my wrestling days. And I was like, okay. So I got out. I, I felt like I was in a really great place. Larry had taken me under his wing. I went and took the three, $400 that I had into my name and got an office that I actually lived in that was like, I mean, eight by eight by 10, probably size with no windows, just a door. And I lived on my futon couch in my own office. And I had people coming in and like, it smells like somebody lives in here. Like I had a couple people actually say that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I actually live in here. <laughs> and so I just started started grinding it out, waking up. I wouldn't go to sleep till 2, 3 in the morning and go back, fall asleep, wake up at 7 and go back to the ground. And I did that every day for most of my 20s. Like I literally worked 18, 20-hour days, got four or five hours of sleep throughout my whole entire 20s. And I built my my first business, California Printing which six months, or not even that, three months later, I had a brick and mortar retail shop on Auburn Boulevard and Citrus Heights. And six months later, I'm doing six figures in that business. Wow. Well, and so while you're grinding, I would imagine you're also educating yourself. Oh, yeah. So how are you learning? Is it like when, is it YouTube? Was YouTube even there? YouTube wasn't how even are a you thing yet. This is 2007. <laughs> yeah. You know? how, how are you, how are you gaining the knowledge to Going to the library, uh, while I was in jail, they had a printing program because I was, I always loved printing. I was fascinated by printing and they had a printing program in there where actually you could go work in the print shop. And then they're like, who wants to go work in the print shop? I'm like, you know, I was like, raise my hand. So I, I had met, uh, the people who were running the print shop there it was a company and I got to do padding and watch how the presses and the different inks and how they did, you know, bindery and all that stuff. So I learned all about printing. So I had all this printing knowledge now that I got while I was there for that month. And then I had started reading books on graphic design. I had started studying some of the other people in town that were doing graphic design and watching. And I'm very good at, like my whole life, I've been somebody that can imitate. So if it was Jim Carrey or Chris mm -hmm. Farley or freaking Shaggy from, like I can imitate the voice. Like that's just one of my gifts that God's given me. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to model what these people who are doing really good graphic design and getting top dollar, I'm just going to model what they're doing. And I'll just put my own spin on it. And so I started doing that. And next thing you know, one client became 10, 10 became 30, 30 became 300, 300 became 3,000. So life changed. That's the life. Oh, that's yeah. A pivotal... In six months, my whole world had done a 180, complete 180. And th so there's so many businesses that start in business ideas, right? And people have the best intentions and it's, you know, whatever form of the yellow pad that they have. And it doesn't always go that way, right? Like that's they're right. not the top cell phone seller in the first 30 days, right? They're not mm -hmm. always making eight grand a month, like selling cars and, yeah. or, you know, m being profitable six months into starting a business. So what do you think in each of those you were, you know, successful in some form? What do you, th how did, like, what do you think made you do it so quickly or how? My love for people and wanting to help them. Mm. So that's the difference when you asked me if I was shady is my, I was always operating from a place of, I just wanted to help everybody. Mm. That was my whole driving force of, I, I want to help as many people as I can. Who am I going to help today? I've had that my whole life. I just want to help as many people as I can. As I saw my dad taking advantage of people, whether it was showing up late, ripping them off, taking their money, taking their investments and not giving them their money back or borrowing money from my grandma, never paying it back. I wanted to be the opposite. My whole goal was to be the opposite of my dad in all those younger years. I may have overcorrected a little bit in certain areas, right? <laughs> as we do when we're trying to be the opposite of our parents. It wasn't the opposite. I just needed to be me. But uh, I wanted to help as many people as I can. And then I have work ethic. You know, that's the one thing I can give my dad some credit for and my uncles is I developed a, a work ethic at a very young age, doing mm -hmm. pressure washing at two, three in the morning at eight, nine, 10 years old, falling asleep in, in planter beds. And I mean, like the whole deal, like I, I had a work ethic from a really young age. Yeah, it's a grind. It's a, I can't remember who said it. Uh, I'm going to get the quote wrong and I, I don't mean to disrespect any, um, any generation. I think it was Dana White who said, if you grind right now, your generation, the, the oh, generation yeah. X and generation Y, like if you just grind, you're you're on the top one or five percent of everybody. That's right. You will be successful. Yep. Like that piece alone can yeah. can get you really far. I was like, I'll just route work everybody. Yeah. yeah at uh, a minimum. So that that's not the last four or five years, obviously. That was yeah. like 2007, 2008. And then I ended up selling that business. 
in 2011, went to Illinois to help my mom, learned Google ads, then came back and talked to Larry. He, he actually brought me back. He's like, you got to come back to California. I got a crazy good opportunity for you. So I started doing uh, consulting work for a home services business. It was called Centrol at the time, S-Y-N-T-R-O-L. And they were doing like 800 grand a year. And between myself, my mentor, Dighton Bradford, who taught me the science of marketing and the psychology behind marketing, which I didn't know. I had a knack for marketing because I've been doing it for years. I knew graphic design and I knew people, but I had no scientific or actual method or process behind me. Mm -hmm. He gave me that while I was there. And so with my natural abilities for design and, and marketing and knowing the digital marketing world, which he didn't know at all, I just sat next to him for two and a half years and just soaked up every piece of information that I possibly could. And myself, him and Larry, we built that company and did $22 million on the oh, wow. third, on the third year of that business. Wow. And that was an insane to watch that company go from less than a million to 22 million in, in two and a half, three years was wild. And were you, was you part owner in that business or you were no, working for I was just business, working for them for as business. a consultant. I was an oh, independent got it, got it. 1099 contractor for them. And so then just I, there's so much in your story. Yeah. So let's bring you to the last few Fine. years. Yep. So uh, I know you've overcome some challenges and yep. it's been some of the biggest growth periods. So can you walk through mm -hmm. um, what that's been like? Yeah. So 2016, I got divorced to my ex-wife who had a son who was three weeks old when I met her, who was my son, um, because I raised him you know, primarily by myself for most of that time. And then for two and a half years, completely by myself up until 2008, 2019, up until February of 2019, uh, I pretty much took care of him exclusively. And so I was his dad and he was, you know, he was all, he's the only dad, you know, I was the only dad he ever known. And, uh, she put my, my life, my wife's life through hell. We went through a, a whole legal case with her fighting. She lied about every single thing in our court case, literally tried to drag me through the mud, make up stories. So hold on. So you guys obviously got divorced because you said your wife. So my you, ex you, you got divorced. Yep. Got divorced to my ex-wife. Got remarried. Got remarried. And then, so then you guys ended up in court. In we ended up in court and she just drug us through, through the ringer, making up stories, just trying to bash me, make me look out to be like some monster. Um, and then I ended up, uh, basically having to give up custody of my son to her because originally it was 50, 50. That's what the judge did. And then over time it just became so toxic. I had to make a decision between my wife and my daughter. Mm -hmm. Now Sonny's born in 2018. I had to make a decision between my daughter and her or my son and having my ex. And I write, I decided to write them out of my story for now, at least her out of my story and him mm -hmm. for a season. Um, cause he wasn't safe either. He was having some behavioral issues and stuff going on. So it just wasn't safe anymore. And so I had to write and I haven't seen him now since 20, 2019, February, 2019. Oh, I got to dive in. So if I don't know you, I can say the cycle repeated itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now you have a son who doesn't have a father who has behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. So how did, what, what did that, how did you reconcile going through that because we heard what happened with your dad i can see it feel it hear it mm -hmm. and now you're being painted as that yeah very very thing yep how did, how did what was that time like for you that was the hardest i was the darkest and deepest kind of depression that i went to not having him after him being by my side 24 7 365 from baseball to bat i mean i did everything put him in the best schools like i tried to do the best i can to to give him the life that he wasn't given the opportunity to have and letting him go was me making a choice to choose my daughter and my wife over him, unfortunately. And I could not continue to allow my ex to be in my life in any capacity because she would, I would, I would be alone without my daughter or, or him right now. Yeah. Right. So it was either have nothing or at least have my daughter and my wife. Yeah. And those choices, uh, I haven't been in that situation, so I can't say I relate. I'm not going to say that. They're yeah. Incredibly, incredibly difficult. At some point, he's probably going to hear this. Um, oh, yeah. So what message do you have for him? Like, who knows how old he'll be when he hears it? Yeah. Maybe it's 10. Maybe it's maybe it's 36. Yeah. At your age. Like, um, well, I have a feeling that when he's old enough, my guess is somewhere between 16 and 18. Um, he'll reach out to me because I laid a very good foundation with him for all those years mm -hmm. and just loving him. I wasn't perfect. Not, not a parent on the planet is right. Spanked him too hard a couple of times. Like, but I, I, I never did, did him wrong. Like my parents did me. 
And so I know I laid a really good foundation for him in those first five years that I, that I had him primarily. And so it's just a matter of time. I know it's just a, a season that seems painful. It's not a day that goes by that I don't think about him, miss him. I mean, I got him in my wallet. I got him in my car. I mean, I, I take him with me everywhere. And so he's a huge part of, of my life. And that'll never change no matter how much time goes by. And so when he decides to reach out, he reached out to me via text message on her phone about a year and a half ago, two years ago. I was like, Hey, it's Joseph. And I missed it by like 20 minutes. And I, by the time I replied, I never got a response Mm -hmm. from him. So he's only 11 right now. So the way I look at it is I got five, six, maybe five or six more years left. And at that Mm -hmm. point, um, I know he'll reach out. And then when he's an adult, that'll, everything will change at that point. And then we'll get to have a sit down conversation and I'll tell him exactly what happened and why it happened and why I had to make the choice that I did. But my love has never, never, never faded or faltered for him whatsoever. Yeah. Hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Yeah. Uh, and then for your daughter, who's going to listen to this at some point and, mm-hmm. yeah. and going to decipher it, that you clearly had to make difficult decisions. Um, how do you, how do you want her to view this time of your life and who you are and, going through that for her mother and for her. Yeah. I mean, her, her and her mom are, I had to make a decision like they're my blood and they, they had to come first in this situation because it meant keeping, keeping my daughter safe. Um, and my wife was going through postpartum and depression and all kinds of stuff on her side. So I had to make this choice and I had to make a really hard choice. It was the hardest choice I've ever had to make, uh, almost killed me. And so I think that my daughter just needs to know that she is the number one thing in my life, her, her and, and my wife. And there's nothing, no choice that will lead me to not choosing them first. Yeah. Did, did it, did it change you? So there's the part of, you mentioned the deepest depression and, you mm-hmm. know, it just incredibly hard choice for you to make. Is mm-hmm. there anything in there looking now you have a little bit, I think of yeah, you time. Know, time and yeah. Hindsight is, any big revelations in that outside of it? You know, it's just a tough choice and you had to do what you had to do. Um, I think I beat myself up for it for the longest time and tried to blame myself. And maybe I wasn't a great dad and maybe this and maybe that. But there's certain things that are out of our control. We can only control the controllables. And it's not what happens to you. It's how you respond. And that'll kind of take us into this last few years. Um, but really, the focus for me was just um, keeping both of them safe. And I just knew that for the meantime, like I fought for two and a half years and racked up a $30,000 legal bill for him Mm -hmm. to try to keep him. It wasn't like I just gave him up without a fight. I spent $30,000 on attorney that I'm still paying to this day, still owe. And, um, and so I, I fought for him the best I could, but they hired a ruthless, better attorney than I had and they won. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately I had, couldn't fight the court system. And so I had to do what I had to do, but I definitely wouldn't change anything. Um, Mm -hmm. I fought as hard as I possibly could to the point of almost ending my marriage and my relationship for a second time. Mm -hmm. I was considering giving it up just to be able to try to continue to fight for him. Uh, but I wasn't going to be separated from my daughter for anything. Like that's, that's a piece of me. That's my part of my soul. You know, there's, there's a chemical bond there that you just, nothing can touch. So, um, there was just nothing that was going to come against that. And then in 2000, 19, uh, my wife started to get better and started to recover, uh, from all of her stuff. And, uh, there was still some work to do. And then I started doing some work. And then in 2020, um, I started really surrounding myself with some high level business people and mentors and some personal coaches started getting some counseling from a guy. And that was really helpful to try to get over all the stuff that had happened with Joseph. And that counseling helped me level up my relationship, helped me communicate better, helped me start leaning in when she was a little prickly, right? When, <laughs> when those moments where she's like, don't touch me or leave me alone or don't talk to me. I had was to learn how to like. first type of therapy or any counseling? Mm-hmm. It was the first it was, real counseling. In your life? Yeah, it was, at, yeah. was in yeah. 20, 2019, 2020, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really impactful for me to help me realize that it's 90% of the fight and, and why marriages end is because of communication. Mm-hmm. It's not a lack of compatibility. It's not that you grew apart. It's you stopped learning how to communicate with each other. And so um, I learned how to communicate again or for the first time, really, in a way and not like run or put my walls up or guard myself or try to protect myself. Because that's when I feel attacked. It's like <laughs> walls go up, oh, yeah. just disconnect Defense. myself. I don't want to get hurt. And that's what I, that was my default behavior. So I've learned that in those moments, that's when you put your hand on her hand and put your hand on her leg or give her a hug and lean in, regardless of what the repercussions is like, get away from me or I don't want you to touch me, whatever, <laughs> whatever happens, I have to be willing to take 
make that sacrifice and just know that I have to lean in anyway. Yeah. And so that was a huge help. And then um, I continued to get counseling. And then in 2021, I had my first million dollar year in business wow. uh, because of the people I had surrounded myself. I started doing cold water immersion, Wim Hof, breath work, and really started to heal some of the internal things. I had some major breakthroughs in my Wim Hof breath work and some of the meditations I had done. Um, my faith was at an all time high and it just really deepened my faith, reading my Bible, volunteering, doing work with at risk youth, like a lot of that stuff, um, doing winter camps with kids. And so just really chasing after the faith part of my, part of my life more than ever. And it was really strong. Even before my marriage, I really kind of came to, came to Jesus in a big way in like 2016 at the end of my, my previous marriage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so by, by 2020, 2021, I was like really deep into my faith stronger than ever. And so now I'm going to counseling, getting therapy, doing Wim Hof breath work, doing ice baths, just really starting to level up. And the fruits are starting to show in my personal life and in my business. My marriage is starting to get better, uh, but we're still working on some really fundamental issues, trust issues and stuff that had happened mm -hmm. from the court case and all this stuff. So we're still trying to figure out these, these fundamental issues of trust, which is a really big deal. If you don't have trust in a relationship you don't have yeah. much. Right. So we're still trying to work that out, but relationships starting to get better, starting to recover from all the stuff that we had been through, which was really hard. It's an interesting transition. Cause I want to talk about where you're at now mm -hmm. so and what you do now. So, um, let's pivot to that Sweet. and talk about what you're doing in your business now. Spend How a few you came minutes. back. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you want people to know about who you are now, what you're doing now and, and how we can leverage your services? So I am a brand strategist, marketing consultant. I help companies come up with their brand strategy and develop a marketing plan that they can then create a deliverables and an actions list, a, like a deliverables list to then implement to actually go create and distinguish themselves from everybody else in the marketplace, all the noise, all the crowded space. Most people are just throwing stuff at the wall and hoping that it sticks. I actually give you a real plan that's rooted in your purpose, in your why. Like my why is to help at-risk youth and restore broken families. I couldn't restore a broken family if I hadn't experienced it myself. Yeah. I've experienced it twice, and I was able to restore it the second time. I thought I was supposed to restore other people's broken families, mm -hmm. which I know that I am, but I had to restore my own first because the first time I gave up, right? I could have tried to fight for my first marriage. I'm glad I didn't because it wasn't supposed to happen that way. The second time I actually restored something that no one thought. I mean, my best friend was like, I didn't think there was. I thought for sure you guys were done. And I'm like, no, and I was, God restored it. I didn't restore it, but learning how to walk through that process and restore it. So that is my purpose and why. And I wrap everything that I do around that. All the brands that I work with have some sort of purpose, strong purpose and why behind their brand. And I help them take that part of their heart, their life, their stories, their traumas, their successes and wrap their brand around that because nobody else has walked the path that you two have had and anybody listening to this has had. And so what kind of businesses do you work with? I was just going to ask that question. Yeah. Did I take your question? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. It's okay. It's the same one. Uh, social impact brands. So mm -hmm. a company called LGen.com that only works with veterans. WeTip.com that uh, helps uh, their largest anonymous tip reporting company in the country. They stop school shootings and bombings. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Next Gen Septics that works with veterans. A lot of social socially impact driven companies, people that have a mission. They don't, their priority, and that was my thing through all those years of you know, on the hustle, it was never about the money. It was about the impact. Mm -hmm. And so anybody that's trying to make an impact and help people in the world and actually do good in the world, money is a byproduct of that. The success I've had, the reason why I had top sales and successful business is because I focused on helping people. And the natural reaction of that was I made great money doing it. And businesses that you've worked at any, so along the lines of what you do for them, any common thing. So for the business owner or entrepreneur or startup that's listening, mm -hmm. what are some maybe like common mistakes or hurdles that you kind of help people get over anything that you see often? You're like, yeah. oh, everyone does that. Yeah. I mean, the first question I ask every business owner is, do you have a marketing plan? And they always say no, <laughs> like out of 5,000, the answer is always no 99% mm -hmm. of the time. And so they lack a plan, right? If you don't have a plan, you plan to fail. It's like that quote. Mm -hmm. Um, so I help them get a plan together. And once they have a plan, they can see a lot clearer. Um, I help them clarify their vision because they're like, well, I'm like, what do you, what's your vision? They're like, well, I just want to make money or I just want to build a business or I just want to be able to retire in 20 years. It's like usually very generalized. I'm like, we got to think bigger and we got to think more specific than that. So I help them get a lot of clarity around their brand identity, their purpose, and then how they're actually going to bring that to the marketplace. Um, that's a, a big challenge that I see with them. And then another challenge I think um, it's just a lack of, um, probably I would say a lack of 
consistency. Mm-hmm. So they'll, we'll develop the plan and then they'll stick to it for 30, 60 days and then they'll fall off. Mm-hmm. And I have, I've gotten a lot better at holding people accountable to sticking to that plan. But now I'm at the point where it's like, I'm either just going to handle it for you or I'm just going to hand this off to you and you go about your way. Cause trying to do it with you anymore just doesn't work because mm-hmm. there's just not, a lot of people lack consistency in that discipline to, to carry it out day in and day out for long periods of time. And with marketing, if you're not consistent, like this isn't a, a six month or 90 day ROI, we're talking about two, three, four, five years down the road. Mm-hmm. If we're still working together, my best clients that are still with me. Like I have one that's been with me since 2016. He's still with me today is my most profitable, highest ROI campaign that I've ever done. Wow. You know, he spends $1,500 a month and he makes like 30, you know, yeah, off of that 1500. That? Exactly. <laughs> so, but it took, I want that. It took a, it, it took a year He's to get there. Notes. Right. And that's what's yeah. smog. That's just doing smocks. Right. So it, it just takes consistency and looking at the long term. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. And we've enjoyed working with you. So we work yeah. with you outside of the podcast. Yeah. So um, incredible value in what you bring and, um, it's a complete process. It's like not going to be able to tell the entire what you do in a podcast or exactly. a 10 minute conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but this has been an incredible story. I didn't know all of your backstory. Yeah. Um, I've enjoyed it. Uh, I've been captivated by it. Um, anything else from you, Natasha? Uh, no, I think we, it's funny. Every guest on the podcast, we always obviously hear stories and we have worked with you, but definitely didn't have as much insight. And um, through your content, you're very open to it. And I think that's what's really great about the business and the community that I've at least seen. And now that we're a part of, you know, seen around you and working with you. And um, so just, we're, yeah, we're just super happy to have you and thank awesome. you so much for sharing your story. And um, we're now followers and, you know, we, we uh, follow all of your pages and content awesome. and websites and stuff like that. And so um, for the listeners, I guess that would be one thing. Any, where can they find you? Yeah, I would say um, if you're looking to learn and you want to grow, YouTube's probably the first place to start. My YouTube channel, Adrian Boisel, um, A-D-R-I-A-N-B-O-Y-S-E-L. Check out my YouTube. I've got over 400 videos there. I teach almost everything I've ever learned I have on that channel. Um, and then I post some stuff on my, my Instagram from time to time. I'm not as active there. LinkedIn is probably where I'm the most active. Um, I just love the business world and the business you know, marketplace. And so I post a newsletter every single day there. The B- Daily Business Minute mm-hmm. is on there. And I try to give just a nice little... 90 second, 90 second quick dose of some sort of business inspiration. I've been doing this cool thing where I build them around series, like a series, like I can base it off of a specific book or a specific speaker or an author or some sort of topic I'll pick and I'll do a whole series around that. So that's been really fun. And I like just sharing daily content like that. Awesome. Follower, I get it yeah, every day. I get it every day. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I love it. Well, thank you. Thank you for the time. Yeah, really thank appreciate you. It. Appreciate the opportunity.